Hitler wanted Blitzkrieg from above. As the German military prepared to face off against Russia's underestimated yet formidable tank forces in Operation Barbarossa, Hitler belatedly realized the need for a tank-hunting close-support aircraft. The Henschel HS-129 was supposed to fill this role as Germany's Panzerknacker, or tank breaker, however it proved anything but. Despite being piloted by record-breaking airman Rudolf Heinz Rüffer while taking out 80 tanks, the plane struggled to achieve wider success in World War II. Unfortunately for the Luftwaffe, the HS-129 was rushed to the battlefield, saddled with requirements and design choices that doomed its capabilities early on. Development was too slow, production was flawed, and the aircraft was never built in the quantities necessary to impact any significant battle of the war. Development Adolf Hitler did not want to fight a trench war like World War I with slow progress. He desired to see Germany advance through the chessboard rapidly and decisively, recovering Germany's historical territory and expanding it. His strategy required a special aircraft to support ground troops, a tank hunter. By the years leading up to World War II, the European countries had come to the conclusion that bomber aircraft were essential to disrupting enemy logistics and equipment because the targets were often ill-equipped. Protected tactical objectives and high-value targets were more vulnerable to dive bombers than ground troops. As the Second World War broke out, dive bombers quickly established a pivotal role in the conflict. Yet Germany's Condor Legion had proven that an alternative to the dive bomber might exist after being deployed to the Spanish Civil War. Despite being thought of as not suited for ground attacks, the cannon-armed Hinkel HE-112 and the Henschel HS-123 fulfilled the role dutifully. Having proven very effective in this combative role, the Reichsluftministerium decided they needed an aircraft solely devoted to taking out cannons, machine guns, and other ground defenses, rather than only bombing select targets. For this purpose, they sent out a specification in April of 1947 for a heavily armored small aircraft with two or more guns of at least 20mm and 7.9 machine guns. They also required low-powered engines and 75mm glazing for the cockpit windows. They anticipated that such an aircraft would be attacked by small arms fire from enemy troops, which required heavy protection for the cockpit, engines, and body. Bulletproof glass for the canopy would protect the pilot. Such an aircraft would focus on low-level, head-on attacks, which meant the cockpit needed to be close to the nose for visibility. Furthermore, the RLM wanted engines that were not used in any other plane, so as to avoid interference with the production run of the rest of the fleet. This decision would play a critical factor in limiting the effectiveness of the project. Four companies were asked to send submissions, with only two being deemed worthy of consideration. The Focke-Wulf and Henschel proposals battled it out. The Focke-Wulf proposal sought to modify the FW-189 with a heavily armored nacelle. Henschel proposed a new twin-engine single-seat aircraft. Both designs were examined, and in October of the same year, the RLM awarded preliminary contracts to both companies. Still, Henschel ultimately won the final decision. Their design work began in January of 1938, getting the designation HS-129 for the plane in April. The visual mock-up was ready at the end of July, and by August, all design details were concretized. The least appealing part of the aircraft design was the Argus AS-410A0 engine, which was not very powerful. Despite claims that it would result in 465 horsepower, it only ever produced 430 horsepower, making the whole design deficient. Testing the ground attack aircraft prototype V-1 flew for the first time on May 26, 1939. After the first flight, the prototype underwent several changes. However, on June 24, the prototype was almost lost during a crash landing. The two original prototypes were tested and subjected to modifications through the autumn of 1939. Neither was turning out to impress. They suffered from low power and terrible visibility. Still, the Henschel aircraft was one-third as expensive as the design created by Focke Wolf, so the Reichsluftfahrtministerium decided to go with their project. Two subsequent prototypes were delayed due to shortages of materials and key equipment. The V-2's entire engine had to be removed before completion to repair the V-1. The V-2 was finally completed and flew for the first time on November 30, 1939. Both versions had significant engine problems. They were unreliable, and with increased aircraft weight, their performance decreased. 
The plane struggled to pull up after a dive, and the V-2 was ultimately destroyed in 1940 after it crashed due to a related failure. The V-3 was not ready for flight until the beginning of April 1940. Henschel gave it the improved Argus AS-410A1 engine, which still proved to be unreliable. The V-3 crashed in June 1940 and was in respiration until March of the following year, leaving the V-1 as the only working prototype for that period. The Erprobungskommando 129 was created as a special unit to bring the aircraft into operational service. During original runs in November of 1940, the pilots complained about the engines and visibility. As a solution, Henschel proposed building a larger version of the aircraft, the P-76, which would have used two 700-horsepower Nome and Rona 14M radial engines. Instead, they were ordered to use the French engines on refitted airframes of the original model to avoid any delays. The engine upgrade worked, but even though the situation had improved, it was still not optimal. A new canopy design also improved the visibility issues. Production The production and deployment of the HS-129 suffered from complications with the design and poor decisions from the high command of the Luftwaffe. They had underestimated the need for a plane that could take out tanks until it was too late in the war. During Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the USSR, the German intelligence community had calculated that the Soviets had around 10,000 battle tanks. To their surprise, the Soviets brought out over twice as many. The Germans were prone to mistakes of this sort during the last years of the war. Furthermore, the Third Reich government did not create an environment where Henschel could successfully produce grand quantities of its aircraft. As an all-purpose manufacturer, they were ordered to build planes and parts for other companies. This meant that aside from the eight production prototypes and the three design prototypes, the HS-129 had a small production of 870 aircraft. This number pales in comparison to the 33,000 Messerschmitt Bf-109s the Luftwaffe used. Once most of these 870 planes were in service, the German army was already in a defensive role and desperate. Although the HS-129 did prove to be effective against Soviet tanks, they were rarely present with sufficient armament and in large enough quantities. There were never more than five squadrons of these aircraft for a battle. Still, the HS-129 was also haunted by design issues. It was incredibly slow. If fully loaded, it could only achieve a top speed of less than 200 miles per hour. Furthermore, the projected 3-inch canopy glass limited the pilot's view. For the entirety of its deployment, it had a poor climb rate and a slow and long takeoff run. To make things worse, the French engines on the plane were susceptible to sand and dust, making them seize during flight with no previous indication that something was going wrong. Yet most of the HS-129 pilots enjoyed the aircraft due to its safety features. It was considered almost indestructible. Pilot Rudolf Heinz Ruffer became a ground attack record breaker by achieving the destruction of 80 tanks, mostly from an HS-129. He went down in history and received the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. He was a strong proponent of the aircraft due to its role in making him a tank-killing ace. Unfortunately for Ruffer, his streak came to an end in 1944. While flying over Poland, his HS-129 was hit by a Soviet anti-aircraft gun that made the plane explode. North Africa. Some of the HS-129 squadrons were sent to North Africa after the Allies took El Alamein. They entered the battle in November of 1942. Their deployment was a big mistake. The engines had inferior dust filters and quickly overheated, making the aircraft a terrible choice for battles in the desert. This ended up destroying almost every unit. During their very first engagement, they were hit by two sandstorms that forced the Germans to ferry them to the west. By the end of December, the seven surviving planes arrived in Tripoli, but none of them were operational. Three of them were destroyed during an air raid, and three more were deemed irreparable. The one surviving plane was sent to the Eastern Front. A new wave of HS-129s was sent to North Africa at the beginning of 1943. Planes were sent behind German lines to destroy tanks without anti-aircraft defenses that had made it past the front lines. While this reduced aircraft losses for the Germans, it also limited the usability of the HS-129. Furthermore, the planes had to be escorted due to newfound Allied control over the air. As the number of available escort fighters went down, the Luftwaffe ordered all HS-129 units to evacuate. By the end of August 1943, all remaining planes were at the Eastern Front. Eastern Front The HS-129 was considerably effective when it first fought with the Germans. It was introduced to service in the Eastern Front in multiple frontline roles. 
Since the main goal was to have the aircraft work as anti-tank support, it underwent several gun upgrades. Eventually, the HS-129 was given a 75mm gun that reduced mobility and speed to the point that made the aircraft barely flyable. Their biggest weakness was the lack of large available numbers. By February 1943, only three squadrons were using the planes. If they were employed at full strength, there would only be 40 operational HS-129s on the Eastern Front at any given time, and this rarely happened. It was then decided to move the aircraft from the front lines. Only the Soviet tanks that broke through were destroyed by the German planes. Oberlieutenant Otto Weiss took over command of the three units in early April 1943, and by the end of the summer, he had control of five HS-129 units due to the arrival of those evacuated from Africa. Over the remainder of the spring and early summer, the aircraft were used to fight in the Russian Taman Peninsula. They were withdrawn in anticipation of the Battle of Kursk, where the German Mk-103 10mm cannon debuted to bitter disappointment. Still, the HS-129s were valuable at the battle, since they destroyed multiple Soviet tanks. Unfortunately, there were still not enough HS-129s to change the outcome. The situation repeated during the retreat from Ukraine. The Germans began to incur significant air losses with the increasing strength of Soviet fighter squadrons and anti-aircraft guns. The slow HS-129 could not stand a chance. Beginning in 1944, the Germans were launching their last desperate attempts to stop the Soviet offensive that came after their victory in Kursk. The Germans were thrown back out of Soviet territory entirely by spring. The HS-129 served in the last streak of defensive defeats, with the aircraft's maintenance in steep decline. Production was halted by the fall of 1944, and by the end of the World War, there were almost no HS-129s still airworthy. Due to lack of fuel, None of them were flying by then, anyway. 